Hey, everybody. My name is Joe Schaefer. I'm an attorney at Lippus Matthias, focusing in the cannabis industry. And I'm proud to work in cannabis, not just because of the daily challenges that we all face, but because we're building great businesses, changing lives in the process, and most importantly, we're having a great time doing it. everybody and welcome to season two of the proud to work in cannabis podcast i'm your host carson hummiston the founder of banks and today i'm very excited because i have my friend from buffalo joe schaefer joining us joe is an attorney at lippus and matthias joe welcome to the pod carson i'm psyched to be here and obviously you know the buffalo connection is great and I, i'd be remiss if i didn't start start the podcast off with this go bills Go Bills. I've got my Bills hat on, which actually, it, I know that we, we talked a little bit before we got on here, but we just got the positive update that DeMar it woke up. And actually, the first thing he asked was, did we win? Which feels very Buffalo. What a week for Buffalo. It's been unreal. Reading the tweets and everything that came out, Just let's just talk about the experience that it was. Obviously, everybody around the country had that experience. On Monday Night Football, you got this huge game, and I... With the two of us growing up in the South Town, I was five minutes from the stadium growing up my entire life, and I think you were what ten. It's ten minutes it's ingra- from the stadium, yeah. It's ingrained in our culture. It's ingrained in who we are, and we wear it like a badge of honor often. And then all of a sudden, something so tragic happens. And I think it was it was like I didn't know it was, felt like one of my family members was sick. I'm sure. I assume you felt the same way. Oh, but absolutely. Yet- and I've grew up going to the Bills games with my dad and Logan, my sister, and kind of took a little bit of a break. And now my Fiance is a huge football fan, so I've really gotten back into it, and it, it's been a good couple of years to get back into it with the Bills. And so, yeah, we were watching, and I felt like someone I knew was out there on the field, and it was just kind of, was refreshing Twitter all night long to see if there was any updates. Yeah, the past four days now have been. I feel like we've been on a, just on an emotional yo-yo. It's been crazy. Obviously, with the great news yesterday that he woke up and, like you said, Carson, he writes the first thing he does. He writes. He didn't know that it was two days later. He first thing he writes on a pad because he was still on a breathing tube is, "Did we win the game?" And I love the doctor's response, which was, "Yes, Demar, you won. You won the game of life." And I mean, just reading that and hearing it from the doctors in their press conference was amazing. Only to have today, we wake up to even better news that not only was the breathing tube removed, but he's FaceTiming his teammates and basically hyping them up for the last game of the season and, and going into the playoffs. So if, look, I'm not a doctor. I'm an attorney. I'm, I'm about as far from a doctor as it is, but it seems like all, all signs lead to a full recovery for DeMar. And the doctors are saying that the, the best case scenario is he turns to exactly the person who he was before he went into the hospital, which I mean, at this point is the best news we could ever hope for. Just the, the people of Buffalo. I mean, like there's no fans like the Bills fans, and just to see everybody come together. And I also thought it was really cool to see all the other teams come together, right? Everybody changed their, you know, their Twitter handles and their and their logos and lights around their stadiums just to show, like, the community. I, I was really, really uplifted by, and obviously with the outcomes that we're hopefully moving towards. So it's a really rough start to the week, but it's it seems like we're moving in the right direction. Sure, and... It was, I think that for us as, as Bills fans, there always seems to be a fundraiser or getting behind somebody. And we, we've done this so many times when we made the playoffs for the first time in, in my, as far as I could, I was born in 1990. I don't really remember the Super Bowl year. So I was, ne- my team, my Bills teams were never in the playoffs. And sure enough, you have the, the, the win when the Bengals won and got us into the playoffs by beating the Ravens on that last second touchdown. I think we raised the, the, the fan base raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for Andy Dalton's charity in there. It's, it's something they consistently do, but to see, like you said, the whole, like the entire fan base of the NFL jumping in, the stadiums lit up, different ho- hockey, basketball arenas. I mean, people who you don't even think would ever comment on our, our, what used to be lowly Buffalo Bills being in the spotlight and being a part of the conversation and ra- raising awareness for mental health around and, and the great people. What's, what's really cool is, is the folk, one of the athletic trainers, one of the guys who, who started CPR on, on DeMar is actually my parents' neighbor, which is really cool. And, and his, his little oh, no dog. Way. Yeah, his little dog is friends with my parents' dog. So when they walk, they all hang out. So I, I, I think I think the athletic trainer is going to be a little bit busy these days. But I look forward to hearing my dad's first interaction with them because those those guys are buddies. My dad will talk like me. He'll talk to anybody. The first dog walk. <laughs> I mean, and those, right. I mean, it, 
what I mean, amazing modern medicine, right? I mean, the people on the field just it's absolutely amazing. So yeah. anyway, I think we could probably talk about the bills for this entire podcast and to our listeners listening, we do think that the Bills will win the Super Bowl, so watch out. Anyway, so Joe, we got to know each other because, of course, we've been working on building Vangst, and you've been an attorney in Buffalo. Talk to us about how you decided that you were going to focus on the New York cannabis space. Yeah, I got to give a lot of respect to some of like the OG cannabis people, and I'll, I'll recognize that I'm not. New York came online really in 2019 with the introduction of our hemp industry. And that's where, that's where I got in. I was, uh, I went to law school to work in sports. I thought I was going to be the president of, Buff- of the Buffalo Bills. Growing up down the street, I figured, you no know, neighborly connection, walk right in, no problem. And while, while sports are also a part of my practice and, and I love the work, it's especially, and I think Carson, you're a perfect example of how cannabis in a lot of ways is a young person's game. There's so many young entrepreneurs, bright eyed and bushy tailed, looking at cannabis as an opportunity, obviously with all the social equity opportunities and opportunities for young people we're really kind of millennials are really living up to what we're what we what we pretend to be which is really caring about people and building great businesses and i think the cannabis industry is a great cross section of that you can speak to that more than i i'm just the service provider in the industry but yeah 2019 came around and i was i was a litigation associate and i had the opportunity to just wrestle with some of the hemp regs in in new york state that were brand new at the time and we started counseling clients on how to how to become hemp processors, how to make the first CBD gummies in the state. Then it evolved into D8 and compliant D9. And then all of a sudden we're, we're gifted, well, a gift and a curse, right? But we're gifted with the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act in March of 2021. And since then, it's just been, I mean, it's... They, to use a bad Buffalo metaphor, things have really snowballed. Just, just, and I was honestly, I've been captivated by the space since hemp regs, but adult use is, it's almost, it's intoxicating in a lot of ways because of, we owe the, the, the message from regulators is we, we're building the plane as it flies in New York. And I understand that's not unique to New York, but I think that a little bit nerdy here, the way that the legislation is written, the way that the regs have been, were written in hemp and are now written in adult use, there's a lot of opportunity here. And, and the people who are involved in this space, especially where in my neck of the woods, our neck of the woods, Western New York, Rock, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse. There's a lot of really interesting people who are getting involved and taking a risk on it. And I wanted to be one of those people. You really have been. You've you've made more introductions to Vangst, to us, um, for folks that are getting into the New York cannabis space than anyone else. So it seems like you've really put your flag in, in, in the sand here and you're working with a lot of the companies that seem like they could be ultimately be the winners. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, we're lucky, and and I think maybe this harkens back to what we talked about at the beginning, Carson. It's it's a tight knit community up here, right? I mean, and and I think in a lot of ways, and we look, we love New York City. New York City is going to be hopefully the cannabis capital of the world, and I look forward to working with operators down there. But the reason why, in my maybe not so expert or soon expert opinion, is the fact that. New York State doesn't get to accomplish what it wants to accomplish in cannabis without the ability to farm upstate and process upstate where costs are a little bit lower. The culture is there in New York City, but the culture is also there in Western and Central New York and, and in the capital region. It's New York's a really interesting state. If you look at it, it's not just the city. And sometimes I have to explain to people the geography of where I live, that it's not five, it's not an hour from New York. I'm sure, Carson, you've, you've had to deal with this before. We're closer to Toronto. We're closer to Pittsburgh. We're closer to Cleveland. We're closer to Detroit. We're, we're closer in some ways, depending on how fast you drive to Columbus, Ohio. But yeah, I mean, look, it's 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 a tight knit and a little bit smaller community up here. But I think everybody supports one another. And it's really been and this is what I, I've really enjoyed about it. It's been an education first focus because the MRTA is not is not short. It's a 300 page document. The, mo- the most recent regs that the state released, which we can talk about later, almost 300 pages again. And Unfortunately or fortunately for me, folks have to come to the lawyers to figure out what it says and what it means and how to operate their businesses successfully. So let's talk about that. A couple of weeks ago, the new regs came out. Can you walk us through? I know you and I were talking and you were about to go to the the meeting, the actual right. meeting where they were walking everybody through the regs. I, I, we'd love to hear from you. If somebody's out there that's, yeah, actually, let's just start from the beginning. What did you think, what did you learn in that meeting? Where are we? What does the next year look like? Yeah, it's a great question because, and, and Carson, I'm, I'm going to rewind a little bit because I'll give like a really short state of the market in New York because. Yeah, that would be great. Let's, if that's yeah, okay. Perfect. Yeah. 
All right, so so state of the market in New York, marijuana, here's a timeline because I was a history major and I kind of, my brain processes the dates pretty well. MRTA, Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act, which is our adult use legalization law in New York, gets passed in March of 2021. But we don't make the necessary appointments to the Cannabis Control Board, right, the advisory board for all of cannabis in the state, and then the Office of Cannabis Cannabis Management, its regulatory agency, until late August. There's a six-month delay that just so happened to correspond with Governor Cuomo resigning from office and Governor Hochul, who's from Buffalo, getting put in as as the then interim governor. She was just recently elected this year. Those appointments were dependent on appointments through the governor plus the legislature. Again, not super important for the purpose of our conversation, other than to, to highlight the fact that there was a big delay to start. So then we get to 2022, and we don't really have anything to Classic show for New it. York. <laughs> it's we don't do anything all that fast up here, but we get the train finally on the tracks and they realize, oh, my gosh, we got to get this thing rolling. So as opposed to going through the full licensing structure, which is what the regs that you and I were just talking about lays out. Instead, we do New York basically constructed a conditional market. So there's only three types of licenses that have been awarded in New York, and they were all awarded in 2022. There's the conditional cultivator license, the conditional processor license, and then the conditional dispensary license. The difference, there's a big and important difference, and we can talk about this a little bit later, but the conditional cultivator and conditional processor license were only reserved for those individuals who were part of the hemp program. So if you were a hemp farmer in New York and you grew can you grew cannabinoid hemp in two of four growing seasons, so from 18 to 24, you you basically had first dibs on a license if you wanted it. Same thing with processing. If you held a good, your processing license was in good standing with the state of New York and your GMP audit was good to go, you, you check the box. So there's, I think, about 200 farmers in the state, over 200 farmers, and there could be, I think it's up to 40. They haven't given out all the processor licenses yet, but it could be up to 40 processors initially in the state. So Inste- there's 200, so there could be 200 conditional cultivators and 40 conditional processors. How That's, many of those have actually been awarded? So, so, I'm sorry, so there's 200 awarded and 40 awarded right now. Oh, so, they're, they're, they've been awarded at this point. Yep. Yeah, yeah, my right. fault. The, the application window is closed for cultivation and processing. And then the application window is also closed for the most headline worthy of our licenses, which is, we call it a CARD license, C-A-U-R-D, Conditional Adult Use Retail Dispensary. And instead of just saying, hey, you were a licensed hemp dispensary in the state, the state got, the state focused on equity in rolling out those CARD licenses. And they add some very unique criteria. And I know it, it unique to New York State, I know that there's other states that have equity programs, but here's what you needed to, here was, here's how you had to be eligible to get this license. You had to have an ownership in a business for two years of at least 10%, and that business had to be profitable for those two years that you owned it. And also, you needed to have a cannabis-related conviction, either yourself or a close family member, within the state of New York. That, and we can talk about the court case a touch later, but that the New York focused conviction as or the New York state conviction versus a conviction in Michigan or a federal conviction has become a, a topic of, of, of major discussion and actually is and, a subject and that of court paired case. with And that paired with ownership of a profitable business for two years. I, I mean, I have to imagine there's not a ton of people that reach those criteria in New York state. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, Carson, our phone was ringing off the hook at the beginning for conditional cultivators and conditional processors, just people wanting to get the, the license application right when we were doing it. We got so few calls. I mean, look, ultimately, there were 900 applications submitted for a total of 150 spots. So th- the state was able to pull a lot together. But I think because the eligibility criteria was so specific, a lot of people were like, you know what, we're going to wait until the permanent right. regs come out and we'll go after the regular dispensary licenses because I, this is just going to take a lot of paperwork. And and I give the state credit for sticking to its guns. I, it, it took a lot of heat, but at the same time, it is a true equity focused license. And we hope that those people are going to be really successful who get this license and are able to operate under it. And those 150 have been now, they're, they're, they're working on becoming operational? So right now, and this is where the, the court case that I referred to kind of comes into the equation. So the the Day when 
so I saw you guys at, at MJ BizCon out in, in November in Vegas. Yeah. And what happened? That feels like a, that feels like a century ago. Oh uh, no, it's, it's kind of wild. So we were kind of talking about all this and w- what was going to happen. So all, there's 14 regions of New York state that the state breaks it up into. And when you applied for this card license, you had to rank your top five regions. So that's how an applicant goes through. You fill out all your applications, you rank your top five regions. The issue was there was a gentleman who had a Michigan-based conviction whose company wanted to apply for a New York license. And he said, you know what? Because I have a Michigan conviction, I'm not eligible. And therefore, this card program is discriminating against citizens from other states, which is unconstitutional under, you ready for this? The Dormant Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Carson, I did three years of law school. I've been a lawyer for five years now. I studied the Dormant Commerce Clause for approximately two minutes when I read one paragraph <laughs> about it in my con law textbook. Okay. I had to, we all, all of us lawyers in New York, we had to teach ourselves what this meant. And it basically means that in business, states can't discriminate against citizens of other states and their business if they want to come in. The irony of it is that, look, you you know this better because you operate in all these markets. There's a reason why we don't have a safe banking act. Everything in California has to say in California, everything in right. Colorado right. has. So we the whole point of the card license was to help those individuals in New York who previously served time, were arrested based on New York law that discriminated against them for having cannabis in some way, shape or form. And now someone from Michigan is challenging that law and saying, hey, this is unfair to me. And what does the court do? The court says, hey, Michigan company, you're right. This does violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. So The five regions that you've ranked on your application, which unfortunately for us were Western New York, Buffalo, Finger Lakes, Rochester, Central New York, Syracuse, Mid-Hudson, which is just south of Albany, and the big one for the state obviously is Brooklyn. All five of those regions, because this person couldn't even be eligible to apply in those regions, the state is not allowed to issue card licenses in. Wow. Wow. It took out it took out sixty eight potential licenses. There's a lot that will happen with the case. So it took out. So there was. I think you said there was like one fifty that they originally agreed on, and now sixty eight is just wiped out. That's right. Well, wow. For, for now. So for they're, now. They're, for now. They're, for they're now. They're kind of on ice. Yeah. This is why I love this podcast because I didn't. I, it, it, there's so much news in the industry, and this is something that I, I didn't. I, I didn't even realize was going on. When it was happening in real time, we're following this and we're reading the arguments and it was we didn't a lot of us didn't even think that there there were lawsuits are inevitable with these programs right and then ultimately unfortunately for the operators in those regions including some of the applicants that we've worked on because i'm in buffalo i'm in western new york i don't know when my first dispensary is going to open i don't know we've got our processors up and running we've got our farmers up and running but you know they they started to develop relationships with applicants who they thought were going to be best served in this market and then sure enough Well, they have partnerships with people who don't even know if they're going to get the license because the state can't even award the licenses in those regions. Now, what is interesting is the state filed a motion to basically, the legal term that we use is it's an injunction. So the state is enjoined from giving licenses in those five regions. The state filed papers the day after they issued the first 36 licenses. So 36 licenses have been given. They This was like two days after MJ BizCon. So they, they released the... They they released the regs and they gave out 36 licenses in those other regions. Okay. The, so it was the Tuesday after MJ Biz and basically saying, we'll try to fix that injunction. We're going to work through the, through the process. We think our arguments are correct. The day after the meeting, they file a motion to streamline the injunction or modify it, meaning, hey, we only gave our dispensary licenses to those applicants in their first ranked region. We got 900 applications across the board. We've only gave those top 36 and only intend to give the other 150 minus 36. Sorry, I can't do that math on the fly (laughs) in, in top ranked regions. So give us back the other four, like the number two, three, four, and five ranked regions. And you can, you can enjoin the number one ranked region, which sorry, Rochester is finger lakes, but it would give us back Buffalo, Syracuse, Mid-Hudson, and then obviously with the state and a lot of people's biggest interest gives you gives you back Brooklyn. All right, so 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 that was a good walkthrough on the timeline leading up to the meeting with the go forward plan. So I'd love to hear from you kind of now now where we go from here. Right. So yeah, sorry and 
thanks if you're still listening to the podcast at this point nice I know, work I, I hope i hope that, that i hope i didn't lose people on getting into the uh, the intricacies it's, of that no it's super interesting and, and we had my friend ashley from point seven group on earlier in the summer and i mean even things since then have changed she's in she's in manhattan she's working on competitive license applications she's been working on a lot in new york and other places and even since that podcast earlier this year till now so much has changed, and I think people really appreciate getting the walkthrough. So I'm sure that part of the podcast will be shared quite a bit. But now, here we are. It's the week after MJ Biz. The news drops. The regs for conditional licenses come out. Walk us through what that process is, is going to look like and what we know so far. Right. So outside of the injunction, those regs are probably the most exciting time. To, notwithstanding the injunction is the better way I should say it. These regs are what we've been waiting for. The amount of times the clients, potential clients, people that we give seminars to, people when we get interviewed, well, what about this? What about that? Our refrain was constantly, we got to wait till the regs come out. Regs finally came out. The regs are, are very detailed. It seems like they treat everything. They go through a 60-day public comment period, which ends in the second week of February. So anybody, Carson, if you have an issue with it or you're, there's something that you want to do or Vanks as a company wants to comment on, I encourage you and I encourage all of our listeners to read those regs or read a portion of the regs that, and this is the most important part, not all the regs apply to everybody. If you want to be a cultivator and you don't like something the way that they're treating craft cultivators versus large scale cultivators versus medium scale, and you don't like the canopy or the lights or the indoor outdoor discrepancies, Let the state know. They've specifically asked for it. They're legally obligated to do it, but I give OCM a lot of credit. They actually put on their slide when they release the regs, we want to hear from you. Tell us what we got wrong. So we're in that process right now. We'll throw throw a link to... We'll throw a link to the regs in the show notes and all of our listeners, we'll, we'll, we'll put it out on social. Everybody should read the regs. And if you have comments between now and February 2nd, sounds like the moment to to speak up. Yeah, But if you don't want to read the regs, Joe's going to give us the too long didn't read. Yeah, g- yeah give me, a, which is probably going to be the theme of this podcast. <laughs> um, to, yeah, TL, TLDL. But yeah, so 60 days, 60 days that they have to respond to all the public comments, another 45 days for amendment, and then we hopefully roll out license applications. Realistically, if you do the math, the earliest we may see those is May, re, May like late May. But my guess is we're going to see these applications go live end of June. So probably end of Q2, early Q3. And then you're going to be able to apply for your cultivator license in all the tiers. I think there's seven or eight tiers of cultivator license from your small craft grower at 5,000 square feet to your large grower at, I think it's 100,000 square feet in acreage. I could be wrong. I'm sorry if, if I am. I, it's, there's, there's a lot of regs. There's a lot but of But I think the key there. takeaway here is like, look, at some point in the end of Q2, there will be an opportunity if you did not qualify for a conditional license to go and apply, which is pretty amazing given it's now 2023. Yeah, and and I think that there's been a lot of news about the conditional market because it's all we've had. But I, I continue to say this to folks. The conditional market is a drop in the bucket compared to all the licenses that we're going to get. I mean, I, I we've heard upwards 1,000 to 2,000 grower licenses, 100, 200, maybe 300 processor licenses. And I could be wrong. This is all speculation. And then up to maybe 1,000 to 1,500 dispensaries. Again, these numbers could be inflated. The state There are no license caps in New York State, unlike other states. So it's if you have a right business plan and it, it corresponds to a population that's going to need it, get after it. Get your business plan ready. I think Ashley, ta- I've heard Ashley talk about this. She does a great job and she did a great job on the last, on, on the podcast she did with you on New York back in the summertime. But like we've been telling people since March of 2021, like start to start to get ready. Like don't build this plane while it's flying, while we're writing the application, because it makes everybody's job harder. And you have people who've been focusing on this, developing business plans, talking security, talking staffing, figuring out what employees they need. I mean, we've got so many, I mean, Carson, you can speak to this better than I can, but we have, we have New York operators who are ramping up and have, have had employees hired for the past year and a half. Right. Yep. So it's, yep. let's, let's get going. Like don't, don't, don't sit let's on your going. hands. And that's, I mean, that's so exciting. A thousand, potentially a thousand to 2000 cultivation licenses, 300 price processors, a thousand to 1500 retailers. I mean, th- that is tens of thousands of jobs that are going to go live. So just kind of working backwards into it, let's assume Q2. And again, we're speculating here, but if anyone can make a good speculation, you've been living and breathing this. So Q2, we can uh, apply for the licenses. Then how long do you think it would take 
for like the state to review and actually issue the licenses based on what you've seen previously? Yeah, I think it really, Carson. I think this is this is an oper- or this is a question I've thought about a lot because I thought I put myself in the shoes of OCM and said, "All right, we can't modify this injunction. We don't have any dispensaries in Buffalo, which is our second biggest city. Rochester, Syracuse, three of the biggest cities in in the western and central New York regions. I'm going to prioritize trying to get dispensary licenses given in those in those regions because people are chomping at the bit." I mean, the hope is that there's going to be more of the card licenses given out. But, you know, the thought is, and I don't know how the state's going to do this. This is just my speculation. But where there is need is really where I think they might end up prioritizing. I mean, they could prioritize the supply chain as they have and start with nursery and cultivation and go to processing and and distro and, and then move on to the retail side of things. But all things considered, based on the challenges that the market is faced and the state is faced from especially this legal challenge, you might. It, I wouldn't be surprised to see dispensary licenses specific in Western New York, to Western New York, Central New York locations, Mid Hudson and Brooklyn being prioritized because of a gap that the state needs to fill, unless they're right. able to be successful right. successful in getting this case kicked. And that's just one example. But we're going to need. There's not a ton of product being grown in the state with only 200 farmers and and a one acre cap on what they can grow. I think cultivation licenses are going to be right. That's another thing we didn't really touch on. Like these are pretty small farms right now where the cannabis is being grown. So yeah. So it's there's definitely a need for it. So so hopefully, I mean, do you do you think there could be a world where there's a less than six month turnaround time from application to licenses being awarded? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think if just based on our our experience in conditional. I mean, I think it was about. In the quickest, if you were able to get your application in the early, like the early window, I think they were, they could have been awarded within, I don't know, two months, two to three months. So yeah, I think that Mm. six months could, in some circumstances, could be long. I guess the qualifier is there were only so many cultivation licenses that were coming in, or conditional cultivation, conditional processing licenses that were coming in. But if you were one of the first ones to apply in those circumstances, you were awarded and you got to get up and running pretty quickly thereafter. So the state really wants to build a successful industry. And like you said, Carson, the the clock's been ticking for a long time. You didn't say it, I'm paraphrasing, but. It's been ticking, I'm I'm saying it. I, mean, yeah, look, we, I, I think like it's really exciting and I'm, I'm, I'm like, a, as you're speaking, I have all these thoughts going on in my mind about just all the jobs that are going to be created and like now's the moment, right? If in, I think if you own an ancillary business that you plan on having service the New York market, it seems like now's the moment to start getting in and start paying attention. And if you're an operator that wants to win one of these many licenses, like getting your business plan together now, partnering up with someone like Joe, getting your business plan together and getting ready so that you can get your application in in that first window. I mean, it sounds like now's the moment to really begin ramping and, and somewhat the moment that we've all been waiting for. I mean, there, I could see a world where this next year, this time, you can drive down the street in Orchard Park or somewhere in, 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 in Buffalo and go to an amazing dispensary. I mean, 12 months will be here before we know it. It will. And the hope is that there's a dispensary right near the new stadium down in Orchard Park. Mm-hmm. So you can hit that on your way in. Your, your, your bills tailgate. Not that the products or the plant aren't necessarily there already, but you know, you have uh-huh. New York State legal third party tested cannabis. Maybe there's a Josh Allen strain. Who knows? You know, it's, I think maybe the Josh that, Allen strain for sure. I, I think well, maybe Carson, I, I'm sure you have a few people who might be able to, to work with us on that. If you want to talk offline and maybe work on that together, I'd be more than happy to see if we could partner with Josh. <laughs> I think we got, I think that's definitely something we got to talk about offline. Switching gears a little bit. I mean, obviously now you've been working in the space for a couple of years. You've been instrumental in getting the New York program going. I think you understand the New York regs better than anyone. Anytime I have a question, Joe's on my speed dial at this point. So, so what if you, what has been the most interesting in going through this, right? Seeing an industry built from nothing or legally yeah. nothing to, to, to where it is today and where you see it going. What, what's been the biggest thing that you've learned? The biggest thing that I've learned thus far and look, do a, a, some some work in the alcoholic beverage space as well. And that's where it's it served me well because the cannabis law and, and how it's going to be regulated in the state, at least initially, is based on the New York's ABC law, alcoholic beverage control law. The ABC law does not is not flexible. The state it sticks to its guns. What I'm most excited for in in the coming months are to see what the state does with social equity applicants and how it really focuses on its social equity program because the MRTA there are two goals of it. One, tax revenue for the state of New York. Two, 
right the wrongs that were committed against folks for cannabis prohibition over all the years. Stop and frisk in New York City is one example. Right. The state has a lot of a lot in its arsenal. And I, that's something that I'm really looking forward to seeing. We've been trying to incorporate it. But right now, we just we don't necessarily know what we're aiming at. We have goals. But right now, it's like the state doesn't want to get in anyone's way by saying, hey, you should do that because you're an entrepreneur, Carson. Your ideas are better than the state's ideas. And it's there's going to be a lot, as we discussed with the amount of licenses, there's going to be a ton of people coming in with a ton of social equity plans. And sure, you can borrow from somebody, but I think in a lot of ways, New Yorkers, we think we're the best in a lot of ways. Or Buffalo, we're so proud of who we are. We think we can do it the best too. And it's we, the state doesn't want to get in the way of that. So that's the thing I'm most excited for in the, in the coming years. But the thing that I've learned is I've been doing a lot of cleanup. I, I enjoy working with my clients. And I think that because everything is is so new and there isn't a lot of structure. We don't know what we're aiming at. And when we have a little bit more structure, I think it serves everyone well. So I know this sounds self-serving, but the earlier you talk to one of us, one of us being a lawyer, I know we kind of, we're like vampires sometimes and people are scared of us, but it, it can be very helpful early on. And it, it the small cost that you pay up front could save you big time in the long run. And I, I, and I just also fear it's that- a lot. The applications are not, they're no joke. I was we talk about Ashley, Ashley and I, at one point in time, we were sharing an office and like, she's working on these applications and they're the size of a phone book. I, I couldn't believe how it, it's not like starting another business that, that maybe entrepreneurs have started in the past. And so I cannot imagine going at an application alone without a lawyer like Joe or a consultant. I mean, you really, and starting early. Yeah. I definitely think that and anyone that we've seen being successful, the number one thing is finding the right lawyer and consultants to partner up with. And Joe, you guys have been successful so far, so it seems like people are going to keep coming. I hope so, Carson. I don't know. Hope maybe maybe all this talk about the Bills and and we've got division rivals. I'm sure the Jets and Giants fans and and my New York State operators might not be thrilled to hear this podcast. But right now, you and I only know that there's one New York team. And uh, lo- looking forward to seeing what, what cannabis brings in, in 23 and all the great opportunities, the great businesses that we're creating. And then hopefully there's a Bill Super Bowl in there sometime. Absolutely. Well, look, this has been a very awesome 30 minutes. We're just about running out of time. So, Joe, thanks so much for coming on. Joe, where, where can people get in touch with you? Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, look, email is the easiest way. Check out the Lippus Matthias website and search Joe Schaefer and you'll see my my goofy face on there. But I am on Instagram and I am public now, which is pretty cool. So J O Schaefer S C H A F E. And then I'm honestly I'm I'm most active on LinkedIn. If you just search my name, that's where I'm I'm it, I've actually been criticized by my wife for for spamming a lot of people's pages with my up to the potentially minute cannabis updates. And look, I just LinkedIn's such an interesting place. I didn't expect it to take off. Carson, I know you're super active on there as well, but like it seems like the place. And I think I just saw an article written about how like LinkedIn is the place for the can for cannabis industry operators to talk and interact and and wrestle with the business in all the different states. So that's a great place to get in touch with me as well. It's a great it's been a great tool and great reach there. And then I would encourage you to follow along on Joe's Instagram. It's pretty entertaining. So you throw in some humor in there as well, which I think we can all use a little bit of a little bit of lightness in our days in the cannabis industry. So everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to another great episode on season two of the Proud to Work in Cannabis podcast. We'll be right back here next week. Thanks, everybody.